We have a fascinating topic this morning, collateral, one of my favorite topics. Uh, collateral is phenomenal. It's uh, one of those beautiful things in economics. It's uh, an asset we produce and then we can uh, reuse it to borrow and again and again and produce more. Um, but it's actually something that we uh, only understand and have conceptualized quite recently, at least in my lifetime, I consider that recently in economics. In 1997, it was uh, two of my teachers at LSE that wrote down a beautiful model on collateral called credit cycles. And uh, it's only since then that we have a conceptual framework and that has led to an enormous industry since then of beautiful papers. Some are in the back, the posters, and two are in the morning session. So I'm very much looking forward. And um, we start with uh, Stefan. So you have uh, 30 minutes. Thanks. Perfect. All right. That works. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome from my side as well. I'm, I'm very happy to be back on this stage. It's probably one of the nicest stages to present research on. Um, so today I'm gonna I'm gonna um, give a talk on a recent research project uh, which is joint work with Karol Palukiewicz, who's also in the audience, who's a colleague from the Bundesbank, and Sasha Steffen, who is a professor at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. And the title of this project is Collateral Easing and Asset Scarcity: How Money Markets Benefit from Low Quality Collateral. Now. This is a paper on, on collateral frameworks of central banks. So let me start by giving you a bird's eye view on the topic. A collateral framework of a central bank um, is essentially the rule book that determines um, which assets are um, eligible for, um, for, for accessing central bank funding, since all central bank funding nowadays is, is taking base on a collateralized basis. As such, collateral frameworks are a cornerstone of monetary policy implementation because they relate to one of the key tasks of central banks, which is lending to banks. Now, collateral frameworks in general are guided by a, a rather old principle that goes back to 1873, was formulated by Bagot, um, which is you should only lend to banks against a good collateral, b at an appropriate price. Now, while this principle Sounds seemingly simple. Um, if you have a closer look, um, there are at least two hiccups. Um, the first one is, um, what's the appropriate price to lend against? This is mainly about um, rate setting and uh, the haircuts that are applied to the collateral. Um, we're briefly going to touch upon haircuts later on, but that's not going to be the main focus of, of my talk. The second hiccup, and that's going to be of much more importance for us, um, is what's good collateral? And good collateral, um, on the one hand side, and that's the, that's the traditional view on things, is um, an asset that protects you against the bad state of the world. So in a sense, um, if you think about safe assets, if you think about government bonds, then according to this dimension, um, government bond is a good collateral for central bank funding. However, um, on the other hand, um, a government bond might not be as good collateral for central bank funding if you think about situations where a central bank soaks up a lot of these government bonds um, in order to back central bank funding and thereby creates frictions in markets um, the central bank themselves or the central bank itself relies upon when it comes to transmitting monetary policy signals to the broader economy and since um, Money markets rely on safe assets or government bonds as collateral. Um, in this sense, a government bond might not be good collateral for central bank operations. So there is this trade-off inherent um, uh, in collateral frameworks, and that's going to resonate through the whole talk, uh, which is good collateral should insure you against bad states of the world on the one hand side, but um, a collateral framework also needs to make sure that um, it doesn't interfere too much with the smooth transmission of monetary policy. So as with any trade-off, um, there's no consensus about the optimal design of collateral policies, and if you consider different frameworks, then there's substantial differences in practice. Just take the um, US framework, for example, which is very narrow, only accepts um, a limited um, uh, range of, of assets as collateral, 
um, and only allows a, a very small subset of counterparties to um, access central bank funding, whereas the um, ECB's collateral framework, on the other hand, is very broad-based, um, both in terms of asset eligibility and in terms of counterparty eligibility. Um, and the differences here are often due to institu the institutional background that a central bank operates in, which is market-based in the US and rather bank-based in the euro system. Um, what both collateral frameworks, or more collateral frameworks, all collateral frameworks have in common is that traditionally, um, in the past, those collateral policies have been viewed as a rather passive ingredient of monetary policy, reflecting this insurance-like character of the framework sitting at the sideline and only coming into play um, when there is an actual default of adapter and when it comes to liquidating the collateral. However, this has changed um, with the growing size of the balance sheet of central banks. There's a larger footprint of central banks in modern financial markets, which means more collateral is being soaked up um, for, for central bank operations, making collateral frameworks uh, a more active um, tool of monetary policy, a supplementary tool of monetary policy, and this is also something that we're going to um, argue takes place uh, in our case. And there's more recent work that highlights this more proactive role of, of collateral policies, just to mention two papers. The first one is uh, written by, two coll uh, by colleagues of the Banque de France. Um, they showed that an extension of the collateral framework um, towards um, debtors that are previously ineligible. Um, leads uh, or, or makes banks uh, charge them lower loan rates um, because in the end um, eligibility as, as central bank collateral um, kind of like increases the convenience yield of a loan for the bank so it makes it more attractive um, to, to originate the loan and the debtor um, benefits from that. Um, a second paper, um, it's written by Loriana and co-authors, um, shows that um, when a corporate bond gets eligible as collateral um, for central bank operations, and this increases the securities lending activity in the bond, um, it lowers the bond yields and also ultimately benefits the bond um, issuer. So in both cases, uh, collateral policies feed back to financial markets or financial market participants through the eligibility effect of collateral. Now, what we're going to argue in this paper is that um, the effect of collateral policies is not only limited to this direct eligibility effect, but it also works across asset classes and even across asset classes that seem to be rather unrelated at first sight. Um, so we're going to show that by accepting low quality collateral, um, in our case, non-marketable credit claims, um, one can support uh, repo market functioning, which is largely reliant on high quality government bonds. So there's um, a spillover effect across asset classes. So what's this paper about? Um, this paper addresses the broad research or the research question whether a shift towards a broader collateral framework, and as I said in our case towards non-marketable assets, can promote repo market functioning, um, which largely relies upon marketable assets, um, in particular government bonds. Now, luckily for us, um, the theory has already been developed, um, so we can borrow from a paper that was written by Choi and co-authors, um, where they show that um, in certain circumstances it can be optimal for a central bank to not only lend against high-quality collateral, but also against low-quality collateral in order to maximize welfare and output. Now, while the objective that we're looking at is different to their paper, um, the mechanism that um, underpins their model and that leads to the result is um, very much what we have in mind um, when we, when we um, try to interpret our results, which is that lending against high quality assets on the one hand side, and here comes the trade-off again, um, protects um, the central bank against losses. On the other hand, it can adversely affect the liquidity creation in markets that rely on such collateral because good collateral gets locked up with the central bank and cannot be used elsewhere. Um, so to, to basically turn it around into our context, accepting low quality collateral means that banks can um, use their high quality collateral, which carries higher opportunity costs or higher convenience yield in a sense, um, and they can um, put it to, to productive use elsewhere. In our case, it's gonna be the repo market. 
Our main contribution is that we're going to provide empirical evidence on this channel, which is so far limited. And um, in terms of identification, um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, look at a collateral easing package of the Eurosystem that was introduced in April, on April 7th, 2020. We're going to use that as a natural experiment um, to consider how collateral policies um, spill over to repo markets. But I'm going to um, provide more details later on. Now let me um, start again um, quite high level um, with the, and, and lose a few words on the ECB's collateral framework. Um, and the, the, the points that make it peculiar, um, the ECB has a very broad set of counterparties for lending operations, um, as opposed, for example, to the US, um, who are mostly focused on primary dealers. Um, the ECB has a single collateral set which is applicable to all operations, so it's in the end pooled collateral and not earmarked collateral for specific operations. And the last point, and it's going to be of most importance for us, um, the ECB accepts a wide range of assets and issuer types, including both marketable assets, which is government bonds, corporate bonds, covered bonds, and also non-marketable assets which are largely made up of credit claims. Now, what the graph down here shows you the, um, how the um, ECB's collateral pool evolved over time from 2014 to um, I think 2023. Um, what you can see is that over time marketable assets, which is the green bar, represent the um, largest fraction within the collateral pool. Um, up until 2020, they um, um, make up 75% of the ECB's collateral pool whereas non-marketable assets, so credit claims, only make up 25%. Going forward, um, there was both an increase in the overall collateral pool, which was due to the large-scale refinancing operations. Um, and if you, again, look at the bars, um, you can see that this increase um, came in hand with an uh, increase in the fraction of non-marketable assets that have been pledged as collateral. And um, what we're going to argue is that this increase is, um, is um, mainly or to a large part uh, due to the extension of the collateral framework towards additional credit claims. What you can also see in this graph here is that usually um, outstanding credit um, is lower than the collateral that is pledged by the ECB. So banks are usually over collateralized um, when it comes to central bank refinancing operations. All right, so what's our empirical strategy? What we're going to do is we're going to exploit an ex extension of the additional credit claims framework taking place on April the 7th, 2020. Um, it consisted of two parts. The first one, um, which we're going to focus on, um, it extended the set of collateral to loans that do not fulfill the general eligibility criteria as laid, laid out in the general collateral framework um, in 2020. Um, that was loans that came with a government guarantee uh, and loans uh, with lower credit quality than usual. A second part of the collateral easing package that we're gonna, not going to look in detail, we're currently working on some analysis along these lines, is that um, there was also a general reduction in the haircuts across asset classes um, by a proportional 20%. Um, we're not going to look at it in detail, but in the end we're going to argue that both measures are economically similar in a sense that um, they both made credit claims more attractive. Um, first of all, those new loans that have not been pledged uh, or that have not been eligible before, think about it as them having an, a haircut of 100% and then going to something below 100%. Um, and uh, the haircut reduction, um, which again um, also increase the relative attractiveness of credit claims because a 20% haircut reduction of credit claim, um, which, starts, which starts with a higher haircut, is, um, is, is um, relatively more attractive than a 20% reduction in a, a haircut of, for example, a government bond, which already has a very, very low haircut. So we're going to argue that economically they're, they're similar. Um, what we're then doing is we're going to take this uh, framework extension as a natural experiment and we're going to split up um, the universe of banks into two groups. The first group is um, banks that are benefiting from the framework extension, which are banks that already before the extension pledged both non-marketable assets and marketable collateral ex ante, which means that they now have a larger collateral pool available due to the extension of the framework. The control group, 
um, is going to be made up of banks that only pledged marketable collateral ex ante. And we're going to argue that um, due to both institutional restrictions, so a bank's business model, and the costs and hurdles that um, usually come uh, in hand with um, pledging credit claims as collateral, which is extended documentation requirements, um, some, some legal restrictions on the mobilization of those claims, um, less automated procedures, the lack of standardization and the limited rating availability makes it very unlikely, and we're verifying this claim in the data, that a bank only starts to pledge credit claims in the short term or as a reaction to the framework extension. So what we're then arguing is that the treatment group of banks, they are the ones who are benefiting from the framework, whereas the control group um, should be unaffected by the framework. Now, in terms of data, and that's one of the assets of the paper, because we have quite granular data on both the collateral pledging behavior of banks on the one hand, and the money market activity on the other hand, so the repo market activity. Um, and we're going to use that data and we're going to combine it um, to, get a, to get a very granular view on, on the um, activities of banks. So for the collateral data, what we're using is the use of collateral database. Um, this gives us a weekly overview um, for the marketable assets on a bank bond level. So we see um, how much a bank pledges for a given bond in a given week. For the credit claims, um, we can distinguish between the total amount of regular credit claims and the total amount of additional credit claims that a bank pledges also in a given week. And we have that information, or our final sample is 129 euro area based banks. Um, for the money market activity, um, we rely on the MMSR data, which is transaction level information on repos. We're going to focus on, on the most standardized set of repos, which is centrally cleared one-day maturity repos collateralized by government bonds. Here the sample is smaller. It's only the 37, it's a 37 euro area based large banks, but they make up for a, um, for a vast, uh, for, for, the, for, for the majority of repo market activity in the euro area. We're supplementing the data with balance sheet information from, from IPSI, which gives us asset and liability information and um, securities holding data um, from the SISG. Um, the main sample is going to be January 2020 to July 2020, so um, three months on each side around the um, extension of the additional credit claim frameworks. Now in part one, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the collateral pledging behavior of both treated and control banks um, with the hypothesis that um, if the framework extension indeed, indeed um, makes high quality assets less attractive to pledge as central bank collateral, more attractive to use elsewhere, then what we should see is that treated banks pledge less high quality collateral relative to control banks and more um, low quality collateral, so credit claims and additional credit claims. Um, we're going to proceed in two steps. First of all, um, we're going to look at the overall evolution of the collateral pool of both group of banks. That's depicted in this graph. Um, we're indexing it to, uh, I think, what's that, April 2020, um, because the group of treated banks is, in the end, it's bigger. Um, we openly admit that. So more banks um, pledge both types of um, collateral and whereas only a smaller subset of bank only pledges marketable securities. What's important for the latter analysis is that the control group of banks is still responsible for a sizable fraction of repo market trading. Um, if we look at the evolution in the collateral pool of both banks, we see that um, the evolution is quite similar. Um, there's one increase before the framework extension, which is marked by the dashed line here. Um, that's uh, corresponding to the bridge LTROs. And then there's a second increase after the framework extension. Um, the dynamics are a bit different, but in the end, um, the, the increase is there for both groups, um, which is due to the fourth operation of the third TLTRO. Now, what this graph doesn't show us so far is um, what kind of assets both groups of bank pledge in order to back the increase. And this is what we're going to look at in the next um, set of graphs. So here, we're basically, what we're doing is we're um, taking the flow perspective. We're looking at this increase here, and then separately at uh, the increase post um, the experiment. And we're going to look at how the different group of banks, um, or what kind of collateral the different groups of bank use. We're going to start with the control group. 
um, we see that the increase before the framework extension um, was backed by 53% government bonds and 47% other bonds. The increase after the framework extension um, was backed by a higher fraction of government bonds, even in a lower fraction of other bonds. But apart from that, um, the, the behavior of those banks doesn't, doesn't look different. If we look at the treatment group of banks then, so those are the banks that, treat, that pledge both kinds of assets. And um, we see that before the framework extension, um, they pledge a very a comparable fraction of government bonds relative to the control group. So 47% um, is the number for the treatment group, 53% is the number for the um, control group. So both groups of banks seem to behave similar um, absent the treatment. Now you introduce the treatment, um, you can see that after the um, framework extension, the increase was barely backed by any government bonds, it's only 3%, um, whereas both regular credit claims, and this might be due to the haircut reduction that I mentioned before, and in particular additional credit claims now um, gain in importance when it comes to uh, central bank collateral. In terms of economic magnitudes, um, we're doing a little back of the envelope uh, calculation here. Um, what we, what we do is we assume that without any treatment, treated banks would behave just as if, as, or without the extension of the framework, treated banks would behave as before. So pledging 47% of government bonds, multiplying this with the total amount of refinancing. Um, they have in the post period leads us um, to the conclusion that an additional 100 um, billion of government bonds would have been encumbered without the treatment. So we conclude that these are indeed sizable effects. We then formalize um, the analysis um, in the following way. Um, we're going to run a difference in difference regression um, with the uh, post indicator and a treatment dummy, which is one for the group of banks that pledge both types of collateral. Um, and we're going to relate it to the amount of collateral a bank pledges, so bank B pledges in a certain bond S in a certain, in a given week T. And what we expect to find is that um, the interaction without the government dummy, so basically the effect on the other band, on, on the other bonds would be similar for both banks, so there is no effect. Whereas for government bonds, which is the high quality assets that carry the highest opportunity costs and have the best use elsewhere, um, those should be um, pledged to a lesser extent by the treated banks. And indeed, this is what we find. Here we're going to um, plot the coefficient uh, month by month. Before the um, treatment, there's no difference in the pledging behavior of government bonds between treated and control banks. Whereas after the treatment, um, uh, treated bonds pledge less of a given, uh, treated banks pledge less of a given bond in a given week. And the effect grows stronger over time. Um, all right, so um, this is everything I, I basically wanted to say about the collateral pledging behavior. What we now do is um, we go on to the repo market activity, basically asking that given the fact that treated banks pledge less government bonds, what are they doing with those government bonds? And as I said, one of the um, leading examples of what you can do with a government bond um, is to, to source it to the repo market. One additional result here is that basically kind of like connects both, both steps is that this result here gets stronger the more special a bond is. So the more expensive a bond is in the repo market, the less likely the bank is to pledge it for refinancing operations, which already tells us that the repo market might be an attractive alternative way of using the government bond. So we move on to the repo market activity in part two. Um, we conduct a very similar analysis to before. Um, we have the post and the treatment dummy. Um, on the left hand side, we now have different measures of repo market activity. Um, what's plotted here is the difference in net securities lending volume of banks, which means um, the, the gross lending um, of a security minus the gross borrowing of a security. We observe both sides. Um, with the help of the MMSR data. We again see that before the framework extension, there's no difference in net lending activity um, between the two groups of banks, whereas after, and basically right after the treatment, 
there's an increase in the um, net lending activity of treated banks. So the group of banks that uses both types of collateral indeed uses their government bonds now no longer to pledge them for central bank operations, but to source them to the repo market, which by that time um, was characterized by the structural deficit of high quality assets. Um, they then basically get the specialist premium and can invest the cash at the, um, at the risk-free rate, at the deposit facility rate. Now, what's also important for our analysis, I didn't mention it before, um, but it becomes very important when we look at the repo market. The granularity of our data set allows us to include security time fixed effects here. So we can basically control for any kind of time varying unobservable factor when it comes to repo market activity, which also includes demand for a certain bond. So the effect that we document here is indeed um, the difference in the securities lending behavior of two banks for the same bond on the same day or in the same week. Um, it doesn't matter how you set the frequency. So this means that the incre increase here is indeed a, a supply effect and not driven by any demand side effects. Now in the remaining five minutes of the talk, um, I want to give you some additional results. The first one um, is um, on heterogeneities. So what we do in this analysis is we split up the group of treated banks along several dimensions to see which kind of banks drive the, drive the effect. I want to focus on columns one and four here. Column one looks at over collateralization. So we basically sort the group of treated banks into two groups. The first group um, uh, are banks which have a very large pool of collateral at the ECB relative to their refinancing. The second group of banks uh, is, uh, are the banks with the below median um, over collateralization rate. So a lower pool of collateral relative to the refinancing. We can see that um, the effect on the net lending in the repo market is indeed driven by the um, group of banks with, uh, which are highly over collateralized. The difference is significant. And we argue that it's basically, or one, one way of interpreting the result would be that um, those banks that already have a very large pool of assets um, at the ECB might have even larger incentives um, to put their high quality assets to productive use elsewhere when observing an even more extended collateral framework. Um, all right. Column four. Um, splits up the group of treated banks in terms of portfolio risk. So what we do here is we use um, detailed loan level information from Anna Credit, which also provides us with the default probability of um, the debtors. Um, we calculate the overall portfolio risk in the loan portfolio of each bank. Um, we again split it by the median. Um, and then we're gonna argue is that um, the group of banks with a higher portfolio risk might be ex ante more exposed to the framework extension because as I've said before, the framework extension was mainly coming from loans with government guarantees. Um, those are loans that has been shown um, with, uh, that, that have been granted to debtors with lower credit quality and also directly um, loans with lower credit quality are now acceptable as collateral. So, Banks with a higher portfolio risk should be more exposed to the framework extension, should benefit more from it, and should also be more incentivized to um, source their government bonds to the repo market. And this is again what we find. Indeed, we find that the effect is, is nearly fully driven by banks with a higher portfolio risk, with a significant difference. Now, the second additional um, analysis we do is we're asking um, where do the bonds actually come from? that the bank now sources to the repo market. And there are two options. On the one hand, um, it can be that a bank um, has a bond, ha or uh, that, that a bank um, has pledged a bond at the ECB. Um, now knowing that the framework um, is getting larger, um, there are other assets that can be pledged. It might get back the bond from the collateral pool and then source this bond to the repo market. In this case, we would expect that um, the effect is stronger. So the effect on the net lending here is stronger um, for bonds that have previously been pledged as collateral um, at the central bank. We don't find this to be the case. So those, ba those bonds that are in the pool seem to stay in the pool. The second option that we have is that um, having a larger menu of eligible collateral available 
banks know that for future refinancing operations, um, they don't need um, the same fraction of government bonds within their portfolio, um, which means that they can um, put a larger fraction of their portfolio holdings into the repo market, which means that the effect that we document should be stronger for bonds that um, are A, held by a bank, and B, held to a larger extent. And we find this indeed to be the case. So the effect on both net lending and gross lending um, are, are concentrated um, within the bonds that a bank um, indeed holds in their portfolio. And um, here we use dummy variables. So it's, it's either holding the bond or not holding the bond. We can also replace it with the continuous variable. And um, so the larger the fraction, um, so the, the larger the fraction is a bank holds of a certain bond, um, the more it um, then brings to the repo market as additional lending supply. In the last step, um, yeah. So let me let me no, skip. We don't have time for this. Okay. So yeah, there's a clock. Yeah. Summary, yeah. broader collateral frameworks improve yeah. repo market functioning. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> much. Sorry. So paper will be discussed by my dear co-author, Martina. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to discuss this very important paper. I have 10 minutes, so let me dive right in. So what this paper does it, it, is that it studies uh, the changes of the central bank collateral framework on the funding mix of banks. So borrowing from the private market as opposed to the borrowing from the central bank. And when you start thinking about this question, you can essentially come up with two conceptually opposing effects of the expansion of the LOLR collateral framework. On one hand, you can imagine that this newly eligible collateral can serve as a complement to the already existing collateral. Now, if that's the case, we could expect that the banks would increase their dependence on the central bank funding, while the effect on the private market is less clear. There could be no effect. There could potentially be even the private market dry up as the banks are depending more and more on the central bank. At the same time, you can also imagine an opposing view where this newly eligible collateral can essentially serve as a substitute to already an existing collateral. Now, if that is the case, we can expect no major difference in terms of dependence on the central bank funding, but an important rebalancing of the asset classes that are being pledged with the LOLR. Now, here, if we think about the impact of the private market, there can potentially be very positive spillovers as the banks are now pledging these marketable assets into the private repo market. Now, this paper finds an evidence that is consistent with the ladder channel. And specifically, the authors are using these temporary restrictions of the ECB collateral framework around the COVID-19 pandemic, which um, included additional inclusion of the additional credit claims in a difference in differences research design. And as you've seen uh, in the presentation of Stefan, there are essentially a couple of key findings. Most importantly, what we find is that the treated banks uh, pledge these newly eligible additional credit claims instead of highly marketable assets such as government bonds. And as a result, they increase their activity in the private repo market, which leads to the reduction of scarcity of these assets. Now, looking at the aggregate result, there are a couple of very interesting things. So note that the uh, collateral change is somewhere here where we see the sharp rise. If you look into the aggregate, what we actually see is that there is an increase in the absolute dependence on the ECB funding. So we see that these additional credit claims appear to be pledged on top of already existing collateral. So by looking at the data from the aggregate, there actually seems to be some evidence consistent with the first channel that I highlighted. However, let's start looking into the cross section. And the first thing I want to show you is again the graph uh, you saw so already before when we saw, see the relative uh, assets pledged for controls versus treated banks. Let me start with the right hand side panel on the treated banks. And what you can see here is that indeed these banks that are treated, they start pledging more, uh, relatively speaking, additional credit claims. But specifically, the key focus of the paper is that they diminish the pledging of the marketable assets, namely government bonds. Now, note that additional thing, because that's going to be important for a definitive, we do see some action on the control sample as well. So the government bonds are being increasingly more pledged by the control banks at the same time. Now, diving into the actual micro-level evidence, the authors use this wonderful micro-level data in a difference in differences research design. Specifically, the column number three highlights the key findings. 
you find this negative and statistically significant coefficient, which is essentially telling us that in response to this collateral framework change, treated banks pledge disproportionately less government bonds compared to the control banks. Now, in terms of the mechanism, the paper argues that these government bonds carry a high opportunity cost. And the paper currently develops this rather generally, and it says that this opportunity cost could be related to the fact that these bonds are liquid or potentially sold after assets for other private transactions. The authors also argue that the government bonds are special. Now, my question here is, is it that the German bonds are special or should we be thinking about all kinds of euro area bonds that are special in the same sense? And finally, when the paper tries to analyze this result, it hypothesizes that there has to be some sort of a pecking order that determines which kinds of assets banks want to pledge with the ECB as opposed to the private market. And I want to kind of develop this last bullet point a little bit more in my first comment. And that is essentially related to the fact how do bank makes this economic decision as to where they want to pledge a specific asset? Now, if you think about it, there are substantial differences between private and ECB repo markets, such as differences in interest rates, maturity, but the one I really want to talk about is a differences in haircuts. So these are the graphs that I borrowed from our paper that has been recently published at the Review of Financial Studies, where we compare the differences in the haircuts charged by the central bank as opposed to the private market. So here on the left-hand side, you see the red uh, line is the haircuts charged by the European Central Bank, and the blue one is the, for the same asset class, the haircuts charged by the private market. The vertical difference is this haircut gap, the difference that you can also see on the other side. Now, note one thing. If we think about government bonds, especially core euro area government bonds that tend to be very highly rated, these are the security on the very left side of the spectrum, which means that these securities generally tend to carry very low, potentially even negative haircut gaps. In other words, compared to other collateral, these are actually associated to have the highest opportunity cost, even from the economic uh, you know, point of view. So my suggestion here is to potentially use these differences in haircuts, which again were even more important during the additional credit claims uh, example that the paper studies, and tie that a little bit more closely into why these bonds are actually special, because this could be one of the key factors that drives the pecking order or the decision of the bank where to pledge the asset. My second comment relates to the identification strategy. And specifically, as you have seen, the paper compares the group of banks that are treated, meaning banks that have previously pledged non market stable assets, as opposed to the banks, uh, the groups of the banks that are controlled that haven't been using non market stable assets with previous LOLR operations. Now, my key concern here is that it is still a bank's choice to decide which types of assets it wants to pledge, which opens up to potential endogeneity concerns. And this is potentially important because if you look into the balancing checks, there are very important differences between the control and treated banks. Specifically, the control banks don't really tend to lend all that much to the private sector and also don't tend to participate in Teltro LTR operations. And this is important because the additional credit claims are directly related to these types of uh, operations. Now, my final comment that I would like to highlight is this very interesting result in the second part of the analysis that links these changes in the collateral framework to the money market activity. And specifically in the abstract of the paper, you can find that the authors argue that the treated banks lend out these market have assets as collateral in the repo market. However, as you go deeper into the paper, you find a slightly more nuanced message. Specifically, you can see that what uh, the authors show is that the banks do not really remove these already encumbered assets from the collateral pools in the euro system, but they rather lend out a larger part of their existing bond holdings for the private market lending. And overall, they document that this transition doesn't necessarily work through the bank's existing collateral pool, but rather through its potential collateral for the refinancing operations. Now, when I was reading this paper, I found this the most surprising and the most novel result of the paper. And I would argue that this is, it deserves a little bit more attention and a little bit more detail. Specifically, the few suggestions that I'd like to make here is essentially to tell us a little bit more, given the very nice micro level data, about what kind of assets these banks are actually now using in the private repo market in response to this collateral shock. My second suggestion is that because we really do have this nice data, to open up this analysis and tell us a little bit more about both the respective pledging and the holding behavior. 
And my final comment here relates to the fact that I'm actually very sympathetic to this story because we have previously studied something very similar in the context of Portugal. And we have found that lender of last resort operation can reduce funding uncertainty, which can have positive impact on the lending to the private market. Uh, sorry, lend lending to the private sector. What this paper is showing that potentially this reduction in the funding uncertainty could also have very positive spillovers on the money market activity. And it would be really nice to kind of document this in a little bit more richer detail, especially given the nice data that the authors already have. All right, so let me just conclude by saying that I really enjoy reading this paper. I find it very uh, policy relevant and thought provoking. I greatly recommend it for everyone to read it. And my three key uh, comments are to dig a little bit deeper into the role of uh, government bonds and tell us a little bit more about how it could connect to the role of the haircut gaps or additional you know, decisions that can govern this pecking order of what banks choose to pledge and when. Uh, then additionally to address the remaining endogeneity concerns and provide us a little bit more insights into this impact on the money market activity. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Martina. Um, I am um, going to straight at opening the floor. Uh, so please state your name. Uh, raise your hand and the mic will come to you. And if you're online, um, following closely via the iPad. So we have uh, one question up here and then I turn to Daryl. Uh, Francesco Abadia from uh, Bruegel. Um, I need to understand better this distinction between bad collateral and good collateral. I understand very well that before the application of the risk management measured by the ECB, these are very different type of collateral in protecting the ECB. But the risk management framework of the ECB, as I understand it, is based on the principle of equalizing the residual risk. So the application of haircuts and other measures uh, makes any piece of collateral, or tries to make any piece of collateral, as risky for the ECB as any other. So there is no difference anymore between bad and good collateral after the application. Now, if that is correct, then it means that the ECB, um, by extending uh, its uh, collateral, uh, incurs no new risk and only gets the benefit of uh, adding to the repo. So uh, I need to understand better whether this is a conclusion of the paper that, uh, in a way, it's a free good for the, for the ECB, this increase in repo activity. Thank you. Uh, Daryl, can you pass the mic up front, second row? Uh, thanks very much, Daryl Duffy at Stanford. Um, the, uh, Stefan, thanks very much. The results uh, of your paper suggest that one of the benefits of the collateral framework change was to release more government bonds into the private repo market where they were in demand. Uh, some work by Angelo Ronaldo, I think, is here, and others show that there are pervasive specials in the government bond repo market. So if the collateral framework uh, had the advantage that you described, one would expect specials in the repo market would have gone down since the ECB tended not to relend the collateral that it received to the extent that it was getting government bonds anyway. Did you, did you notice whether the bonds that were most likely to have moved into the private repo market did experience a reduction in their specials? Um, okay, take one more question here up front and then back to Stefan. Um, hi, Ben Hartung, ECB. Thanks a lot for the interesting presentation. I actually have two questions. Um, the first question relates to the ACC frameworks, which, uh, as you know, were only applicable in certain jurisdictions. But if I understand your identification approach correctly, you basically pull um, all banks that had credit claims pledged before the, uh, the expansion. So maybe you can say a word on, on, on how that affects your results, because I, I, I guess it would actually strengthen your results and say that this is because you basically mix up the actually treated banks with, with others, I guess the, the actual coefficients um, would, would uh, even be larger. And the second question is, um, 
I was wondering whether you could also extend your analysis to essentially the most recent episode in 2022-2023 when banks repaid uh, large territories outstanding. Um, do you see kind of a reversal of that? So, so basically um, that the control group of banks also freed up disproportionately many government bonds um, compared to the treatment group. And uh, the, so I guess you could also just apply the, 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 the empirical setup you have to that episode. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, so I have one minute remaining. I know Luke is very strict on time. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go in reverse order. Um, so um, with regard to the, to the um, different countries, and yes, so the, the ACC framework is country specific. Um, some countries are more flexible than others. Um, we cannot really, we would like to, but we cannot really um, go a lot further into this direction because we just have, especially for the MMSR sample, a very limited number of banks, which means that teasing out differences within a country is going to be hard. Um, with regard to the repayment, I, I think that's something we can discuss later on, um, just in the interest of time. Um, then to um, your question, Daryl, um, that was uh, unfortunately the one slide that I wasn't able to show. So we, we bring the whole analysis to the bond level and we show that indeed um, there is a reduction in the specialness of the bond if the bond is more exposed to the ACC framework extension. Um, I can explain the details later on. Um, with regard to the question of what's making collateral good or bad, um, I think that, that hinges on, um, on, on two conditions. First of all, um, one needs to be really sure that you have the appropriate haircut in all states of the world um, to make all collateral as, uh, as risky as the other. Um, and second of all, of course, um, our results being that um, the repo markets benefit from this framework extension kind of like hinge on the fact that um, there has been asset scarcity during this period. When there's no asset scarcity, then um, we might not be able to see these effects because it, it might not be, or there might not be such a such strong incentive for a bank to, to source the, bank, the bonds to the repo market. Um, so it depends on both appropriate haircut setting and the exact time span you look at. Um, they might not be all equal um, in that regard. Um, Martina, thank you very much for your discussion. Uh, I think we've got plenty of time later on to discuss the details. I agree with most of your points, um, some interesting points raised, so thank you very much. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thanks, uh, Stefan. Thanks for the questions. So we move immediately to the next paper, um, which will be presented by Patrick Cohn. Hi everyone, I'm Patrick at TSC. This is joint work with my brother Jamie at Imperial and Anne Caroline at the Bank of England and the usual disclaimer applies obviously. So the wholesale funding markets in the title are repo markets. So I'll skip the description given the audience of what a repo market is, what a repo product is. But they serve two functions. So people access these markets for funding reasons in order to fund themselves. Um, collateral has a role here but only as insurance in the event of default. Alternatively, people access these markets in order to get the assets temporarily, most obviously for shorting. Now, I first presented this paper quite a long time back at TSE, so mostly IO theorists who don't love repo the way that we naturally love repo, and this was my attempt to persuade them that they should, they should care about, that they should be interested in it. So number one, it's important. I don't need to tell you guys that, but it's arguably the single most important source of wholesale funding. So it matters for financial stability. Given that we're gonna talk a bit about shorting, it matters for asset prices. My main point with them was to try and persuade them that there was something unusual and a little bit economically interesting about a market that has two such disparate functions. So we say to a mutual fund that has faced unexpected redemptions and needs funding, go to the repo market. A bank that needs to fund itself, go to the repo market. But we also say to a hedge fund looking to take bets on the yield curve or a market maker looking to manage its inventory risk, we also say to them, go to the repo market. And the question in this paper is how these two functions interact. Do they complement each other? So what do I mean by do they complement each other? So I'm gonna end this presentation with a counterfactual in which I switch off collateral demand. So I say collateral matters only 
insofar as it is insurance in the case of default, but people don't do anything with it. What happens to aggregate outcomes, market level outcomes? Do people trade more or do they trade less? If they trade less and gains the trade are lower, then the two functions arguably complement each other. How does this vary over time and in a crisis? And what are the implications for regulation and policy? So that's what I'm gonna cover. Now obviously some of that is familiar relative to the literature. Uh, so what do we bring that's new? We're gonna focus on the distribution of this collateral demand across firms. So within the cross section. We have good transaction data uh, based on UK government bonds with all firm ID. So we can see not just the collateral demand of banks, but of hedge funds and of various different types of market participant. And we're gonna look at heterogeneity in repo rates across these firms. And we're gonna show that there is a lot of heterogeneity that suggests that they do have quite different demand for collateral in the cross section. We're then gonna build a simple model of repo that says that this counterfactual that I'm going to end with, it can have a positive or negative impact collateral demand, depending on the distribution of this collateral demand across firms. So we then turn to estimation and we structurally try and infer this distribution, ask where it comes from, and then run this counterfactual. Now it's a short presentation, so I won't give a big overview, other than to say that surprisingly we find that they don't complement each other. So in this counterfactual, when we switch off collateral demand, we find that more funding would be provided, the market would be bigger. Which we think is a little bit surprising, given that we've typically thought of collateral demand as lubricating the market, i.e. giving the lender an additional reason to lend. The insight of the paper is very simple, is that yes, you're giving the lender an additional reason to lend, but you're also giving the borrower a reason not to give up the asset. So this question as to which dominates is about the joint distribution of needs for funding and needs for collateral demand. So usually in a presentation this long, I would skip the literature review, but in a longer presentation, I highlight a couple of particularly important papers, and I realize that they're representatives from all of these papers, so I decided I have to put it up. Uh, specialness, starting off with Daryl Duffy, is obviously part of collateral demand. Angelo Ronaldo and co-authors talk about segmentation, which is clearly going to be reminiscent about how we talk about differences in outcomes in the cross-section. And Amy Huber, along with another paper, is part of the growing structural estimation of repo markets. Our focus in particular on this structural measurement of collateral demand in the cross-section is where the novelty lies. So, you know, it's a, it's a structural paper, which means there's model, estimation, counterfactual. Uh, I'm gonna try and run through each of them relatively quickly rather than go into any one in a great load of detail. So the data that we have then is Bank of England transaction data on close to the universe of repo trading against GILS, against UK government collateral. From 2017 to 2023, so a couple of periods of market instability that will be interesting to look at. There are various facts that we set out, some that are novel, some that we use to simply motivate our modeling assumptions. I'm gonna tell you one, which is that the underlying asset, some people care about it in the cross section and some people don't. So here all we do is we regress the repo rate charged or earned by a market participant on various types of fixed effect there in the left-hand column. And we do that for money market funds on the right and hedge funds in the middle. So this number, the first number, 0.5, that says that 50% of the variation in the repo rates involving hedge funds can be explained by the week, so time, and the maturity of the repo product. Now the only thing to take away from this graph is money market funds don't care about the asset. Right? If you look at the right-hand column, 98% of the variation in prices is uh, explained by a fixed effect that doesn't include the underlying asset. Conversely, hedge funds, that number is much lower, and they care very much about exactly which asset they get in return. Now, this clearly speaks to a difference in collateral demand between the two. Right? These are all UK government bonds, 
they're all relatively liquid, they're all much of a muchness. It's hard to look at that left-hand column and say that hedge funds don't care specifically about the underlying asset. Whereas perhaps money market funds, unsurprisingly, given their mandate, don't actually care about what they get in return because they don't use it. Now, I think this is quite convincing that collateral demand varies and it matters, but how much does it matter? Some people have it, some people don't. What does that mean for aggregate outcomes? This is also just talking about rates. What about quantities? So for those reasons, we then think about what can we do to understand and strip out some confounding factors and to quantify their equilibrium effects. So we have a model. Now the model has a bit of setup, but when you see the first order condition, the optimality condition will be very straightforward. So there are A assets representing repo against each of the underlying government bonds. And their heterogeneous returns to both the asset that you get back, the government bond, you do something with it that gives you a risky return, and to the funding. So you do something with your funding and that gives you a, a risky return. So nu is going to be the return to agent I that it gets from cash, its funding need effectively. And eta A is going to be the return to agent I from having this collateral. So this is the heterogeneity in funding demand and funding and collateral demand. There are mean variance preferences with risk aversion and a relatively simple trading structure that says dealers can trade with each other in a competitive interdealer market. They're also connected to customers with respect to whom they have market power and customers cannot trade with each other, which matches broadly the features of the market, which has a very fixed trading structure over time. QIJ is then borrowing by I from J against A, and the capital Q simply aggregate that up across people I trade with, and then again across assets. So you can see that the payoff to firm I, it gets some benefit from funding, which is a function primarily of its new, of how much it needs funding. It's a function of its return from the collateral that it collects as part of this transaction, this set of transactions, which is determined primarily by its collateral demand, the benefit that it gets from this collateral, and then the trading terms. So these are the first order conditions when I said things would become obvious, and you'll see that customer J, who by assumption is marginally landing here, loses cash and gains collateral. So it loses this marginal benefit from cash, according to that new, and it gains some collateral. Dealer I is on the other side of that trade. It gains I, and it loses collateral. And there's some market power pricing effect. Now, clearly this aggregates up nicely. They're all linear according to where they can trade. And what happens is equilibrium quantity then depends on the counterparty's relative characteristics. If I'm meeting someone who has low nu, does not like money, does not need money, and I have high nu, then they're more likely to lend to me. Given that there's a network component and a centrally competitive dealer market, there's also a role for my characteristics relative to the average characteristics of people in the market. Now, if you think about the counterfactual we're going to end with, where we turn off collateral demand. It should be obvious, I hope, I'm gonna give an intuitive explanation, that turning this off can increase or decrease quantities and gains to trade according to the distribution of these news and these eaters. So as a simple example, let's say we only have two firms, say a bank and a customer, and let's suppose we're in a world where there is no collateral demand. People are only funding themselves. One of them has high funding need, one of them has low funding need, and so repo flows in this direction, collateral flows in the other direction. Now if we add in preferences over collateral, you can do it in various ways. You can say that the lander, the person with low funding need, has high collateral demand, so the two are negatively correlated, and clearly that is increasing gains to trade because the lender is gaining something that it cares about more than the borrower cares about. 
that then lubricates the market, if you like. Conversely, you could say that the lender doesn't care about the collateral it's receiving, whereas the borrower cares about giving it up. In that context, the gains to trade are being shrunk and could potentially be eradicated. Right, we're exchanging two products, A and B. If I like one and you like the other, we trade a lot. If I like both of them and you don't like either of them, maybe we don't trade a lot because I don't want to exchange it in order to gain the other one. So this then means the outcome to whether collateral demand lubricates or not, the market becomes an empirical question. So you can think about this model. You know, there are many models that motivate trade via some preference difference or difference in liquidity need. All we're doing is layering over some additional set of preferences relating to collateral. So on the estimation then, our objective is to recover as flexibly as possible this set of news and this set of eaters, this set of funding demands and collateral demands. Where, you know, just to emphasize, within the model, the return that I get to funding or collateral has to be normally distributed. But these news and these collaterals, i.e. the mean of those returns, we've said nothing about the way in which they're distributed. So we want to get them flexibly, basically. There's also risk and risk aversion. Uh, you might ask about whether risk and risk aversion vary, either in the time series or the cross section. We have some robustness checks. And what we have is we have a whole load of Qs and Rs. Uh, the data doesn't have particularly good haircut data, but where it does have haircut data, they're mostly zero, so they don't feature in the model. So one slide then on estimation. This is the first order condition there at the top, the optimality condition for dealers where if you remember, it depends on its marginal benefit from cash, its marginal benefit from collateral, and this price effect. The queues are data, and we're seeking to recover everything that isn't a queue there, effectively. You can get kappa and sigma from variation across J, but within I, T, and A. Right? That simply says I'm going to put a fixed effect in there that captures everything that isn't J variation, and I say, you land at different rates to this J and to that J, and from that I can infer the extent to which you care about risk. Given this fixed effect, I can then decompose that into the two constituent parts, funding demand new and collateral demand eta. Now I won't go in detail into the empirical challenges, but I think a couple will jump out at you immediately. One, we have a canonical, um, supply and demand issue effectively in that both Q and R are co-determined, are endogenous. So Q is endogenous within that equation. We use guilt prices and particular trading patterns as an IV. So some of the J firms consistently trade one type of guilt and not others. So we use those guilt prices, which are plausibly exogenous given that we have this ITA fixed effect in. So this IV does not assume that there are no links between repo and guild prices, obviously not. And then the second problem you would look at and think is obvious there is the separate level identification of new and eta, of collateral demand and funding. A more intuitive way of putting it is to say, well, if I say that a given firm consistently lands at a very low rate, how do I know that's because it doesn't have very low new, very low demand for money, meaning it's willing to land at a low rate, or it has particularly high demand for ETA, demand for the collateral. How do I distinguish those two things? Uh, we use something that has been used in the literature, which is one of these A's is general collateral. Effectively, where I say I don't care exactly what you give me back. For that, we then normalize collateral to zero, and we can semi-parametrically recover everything else given that normalization semi-parametrically in that beyond that assumption that eta is equal to zero for general collateral, we place no restrictions on the shape and distribution of eta over time, across people and over time. Okay, so you can think about this as, obviously there's been a lot of work that looks at how interest rates vary across the cross-section. 
And some of that is due to their network location, the extent of competition they face, and their other characteristics. This estimation strategy strips that out, leaving only what we argue is a more fundamental measure of funding demand, new and collateral demand, ETA. Okay, so on to the results then. So we now have this distribution and we wanna interrogate it and I'm gonna show you some ways in which it varies, some dimensions in which it varies. But again, I don't wanna feel, I don't want you to feel like I'm carpet bombing you with a whole load of dimensions along which it varies. The objective, remember, is to understand this counterfactual. I'm going to show this counterfactual in a sec, but first, I think we can get to anticipating what the results are gonna be, simply based on how these things vary, these eaters and these news vary. So, the first thing is that there's a lot of variation across firms and not across assets. So this takes our funding demand new and our collateral demand eater and again, it regresses them on fixed effects. And if all that matters is that a given asset was cheapest to deliver, for example, and that everybody wanted that, then we would see that this bottom right fixed effect would be much larger. So what this means is that people care differently. There is variety across people rather than across assets in terms of what is being demanded as collateral demand. So to get at that, we then regress funding demand and collateral demand separately on type dummies. One slightly confusing thing is all dealers are banks. So the banks part uh, are the non-dealer banks. And so a big positive number indicates that they have relatively high funding or collateral demand. Now what can you take away from this? You can see that dealers have relatively high funding demand. So this, inter this value is bigger than most of the other ones. And they also have relatively high collateral demand. So dealers, banks effectively, seem to care a lot about what exactly they get in return. Hedge funds, unsurprisingly, also care a lot about it. Money market funds, who ostensibly should do nothing with it, seem to care much less. So this is intuitive, but I think it is somewhat surprising that dealer banks care as much as they do about it, more so than hedge funds. If I had stood up and told you that this is a story about how hedge funds want to take bets on the yield curve and need to borrow assets in order to do so, that wouldn't be particularly interesting. What's more interesting is there's something going on on the bank side here. So the point I was trying to make with the model is that what matters is the correlation across people between funding demand and between collateral demand. So when I think about layering on top a demand for collateral, am I giving it to people who need to borrow, in which case that's going to reduce gains to trade because they don't want to give it up, or am I giving it to people who need to lend, in which case it might lubricate gains to trade. So this is what this table gets at. We simply regress our estimate of collateral demand on funding demand. And you do so across various fixed effects. So the first column allows variation in both dimensions, and then we switch off cross-sectional and intertemporal variation in the subsequent columns. But it's clear that the correlation is positive. The middle column, in which we're switching off intertemporal variation and looking only in the cross-section, is closest to the intuition of the model, indicating that people who need funding also appear to particularly value the collateral demand. So a couple then of figures about intertemporal variation over time. So the left-hand graph shows the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles of new, of funding demand, and the right-hand graph does the same for collateral demand. The two highlighted bits in gray is the COVID-related dash for cash, and in blue, um, the uh, the turmoil, the political related turmoil we had in repo markets and bond markets uh, towards the end of 2022. Now, what do you take away from this? Number one, there's much less variation in new, and in fact, it closely follows the base rate. Those steps are the Bank of England policy rate. If you look at collateral demand, it moves in quite a different way. In fact, we have a regression that shows this separately, both its level 
and its dispersal, dispersion are positively related to volatility, which makes sense if we think of this as people hedging their risk or speculating. So in particular, if you look at what happened here during the dash for cash, the policy rate and funding needs dropped down, but collateral demand spiked. So they seem to move in completely different directions. Not completely different directions, not always in the same direction. So you know, what does this tell us through the lens of this model and this intuition that I'm trying to get across? Well, we see this positive correlation which suggests that when we run this counterfactual, we're going to find that collateral demand actually reduces repo market functioning. We see that it's driven not just by hedge funds and money market funds, where I think you could have told me the story about it before you saw the presentation, but it's actually also related to banks. And we see that collateral demand, insofar as it can impede repo market functioning, seems to particularly do so in times of particular market stress i.e. when we excessively care about getting funding to people who need funding. So does this mean then that collateral demand reduces this funding, re uh, reduces the ability of firms to fund themselves? That's what we're going to do in this counterfactual. So all I do is I set eta to zero for all A, I, and T. Now, given our estimation strategy, that is like saying that people care about all types of collateral at exactly the same extent to which they care about general collateral. So I'm not uncollateralizing things. There's still collateral being exchanged. It's only valued as insurance in the way that general collateral is. And what we find in the left-hand graph, we have aggregate trading quantity. And in the right-hand graph, we have gains to trade, so the welfare differences that arise from trade. And in red, is the baseline, and in blue, the counterfactual in which we switched it off. And you'll see the differences are very material. Now, I would take some of the sizes with a pinch of salt, in that you know we're not actually saying that absent collateral demand, the repo market would be three times bigger. But we are saying that it would appear to be larger. Why? Because of this point about the joint distribution as to who exactly has collateral demand and who doesn't. In this figure, what we do is we reverse collateral demand such that the correlation is the same magnitude but is now negative. So I simply counterfactually say, you guys all have different counterfactual demand such that instead of a positive correlation between nu and eta, between funding and collateral demand, there's a negative, there's a negative correlation, i.e. I'm giving the lenders additional reason to lend. Then when I run this counterfactual, you'll see that the effects flip, and we would find that removing collateral demand in this alternative world in which it were distribu distributed differently would then decrease repo market function. So the opposite result. So this shows that it is a story about the correlation between people's funding needs and people's collateral needs in the cross-section. OK. so. I've got four minutes left to talk a little bit about the implications for policy. Um, a couple of results that I didn't show to you, but I will describe. I've already said that banks are central to this. And you can do a version of our counterfactual in which you leave everyone's collateral demand the same, and you only switch it off for banks. And most of the effects go through. So those large counterfactual effects would still persist. They'd be 95% of that size. So this is a story about banks. You might then ask, well, what exactly are banks doing in order to have such collateral demand? One of the things we do is that we then ask whether the collateral demand of individual participants can predict future bond prices. Right? Because if hedge funds in particular are demanding bonds in order to short them, then maybe we would see that in the future the bond price drops down. And we see that for hedge funds, which makes sense if we believe that they're speculating. But we don't see that for banks. Banks aren't looking to speculate. Now, what we think the evidence shows is that, broadly speaking, banks are looking to manage their inventory risk, looking to manage their interest rate risk. And the issue with the repo market is to fund themselves, they need to be long on bonds because they lend them out and have to get them back. 
when they want to short particular bits in order to manage their inventory risk. So that's the challenge that this paper speaks to. As to the implications for regulation and for policy, um, you know, we don't have counterfactuals that do that explicitly. Why? What the, what the paper is good at, arguably, is measuring this collateral demand structurally and then switching it on or off in order to understand its effects. So if we understand what this set of eaters looks like, the model in the estimation can tell you their effects. What the paper can't do is to tell you how those eaters, how those collateral demand would look different if we had a different regulatory environment related to, for example, short selling. So we don't have specific regulatory or policy counterfactuals, but within this trade-off between banks needing to be long in order to fund themselves, but wanting to be short in order to manage their inventory risk, we can still talk a little bit about what this means for policy. So in particular, uncovered short selling, arguably, breaks to a certain extent the link between repo markets and the need to short, right? I no longer need to borrow to access the repo markets in order to then short. Now, this is obviously only a limited effect because at some point I need to deliver the bond when I'm shorting. But you could argue that it reduces collateral demand and this might allow banks to manage their inventory risk and manage their funding needs more effectively. Conversely, particularly in a stress, central banks, including the ECB and others, uh, sometimes accept other collateral or offer collateral swap facilities, each of which would allow these banks to separate their risk management from their funding needs. More generally, if you look at some of the documentation that talks about what we, or you as regulators, seek to protect in a stress, there's obviously a lot about ensuring people can meet their obligations. There's a lot about ensuring that people can continue to market make these banks. But there's a little bit less, arguably, about allowing banks to also manage their interest rate risk environments, particularly in contexts like the turmoil we had in the UK where interest rate risk is large. Okay, uh, thanks very much, and thanks to the discussant who I think has traveled a long way. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Patrick. Uh, phenomenal presentation and uh, three other for, for questions. Thank you, Luke. Okay, thank you. Good morning. And thank you so much to the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper uh, before I begin. Uh, my name is Sharia Anvil. I work at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. and the views expressed in this presentation are mine and not those of the Federal Reserve Board. So let's get right into it. So the paper that Patrick just presented, I think is extremely fascinating, but also very dense. So I just wanted to first start with just very simply what I thought the research question is. And that is, how are the prices and quantities in the repo market, specifically the sterling gilt repo market in the UK, affected by funding versus collateral demand. And the paper has very rich transaction data, which I'll get into a second of how they are able to use to be able to separate this funding versus collateral demand. And what I also really like about the paper is that they have a structural model because funding demand versus collateral demand will both affect prices and quantities in the repo market, and it's always been traditionally very difficult for researchers to be able to disentangle which of the two mechanisms are usually driving prices. And so the nice thing about having the structural, demand, the structural model, as Patrick just talked about, is that you can turn funding demand off, collateral demand off, and test counterfactuals and see what happens to the repo market functioning. But before we get into that, let me just spend a little bit of time just going through exactly what they're doing in the paper. So let's first talk a little bit about the data. So this is what I mean by they have that rich transaction data that they're using. So they have a bunch of transaction data, again, in the Sterling Guild repo market, where they have a bunch of borrowers and lenders essentially doing repo trading. And these are the different types of borrowers. They have dealer banks and hedge funds. 
And these borrowers, they're the ones that are needing funding. So these are the borrowers that are driving the funding demand. The lenders, they're going to be dealers because they're typically intermediaries, they're market makers, they're going to be both borrowers and lenders in this market. Hedge funds, money market funds, and PFLDIs, which I can't quite remember what the acronym stands for, but pension funds, I think. Um, they're going to be ones that need the collateral. They're going to be the lenders, and that's what they're going to be the ones that are going to be driving the collateral demand. Now, just for someone who is just looking at the summary statistics of the data, this is why sometimes disentangling funding demand versus collateral demand can be quite difficult. So if you just take two transactions, and if you want to understand if collateral is in demand for that transaction, what you would do is you would typically take the repo rate, that is like the price that essentially the borrower is paying, and you would see if it's below what is typically called the general collateral rate. And the general collateral rate or the GC rate is usually a rate that is uh, the rate you would pay for an interchangeable collateral. So just like a, a general collateral. It's not something that is uh, collateral that is, is, it's not a rate that is specific to the collateral. It is just some, uh, it's a general pool of collateral that you would pay for. So if that rate was below that rate, that means that the lender is willing to accept a rate that is below that rate, so their collateral must be somehow special. So that collateral must be somehow in demand. And so that's how, if you were just to look at the price, that's how you would know that collateral is in demand for that trade. But if you were to look at a second transaction, if the price was above that general collateral rate, then that would mean that the lender is, doesn't really value that collateral and the borrower is willing to pay up. And so therefore it must be funding demand that is driving that trade. So that's why you can see that to sometimes disentangling funding demand versus collateral demand in these transactions can be quite hard because it's kind of endogenous. So in this paper, they're able to disentangle these two mechanisms that are driving prices and quantities, and they find that funding demand follows the UK monetary policy stance, which I thought made a lot of sense because you know, it makes sense that once you know, the central bank makes borrowing more expensive, then funding demand would increase. And the, but collateral demand actually follows gilt secondary market prices. The second finding is that collateral demand varies very significantly across like, repo lenders. Patrick just showed you that hedge funds demand collateral very differently than money funds versus ped, pension funds. But finally, I thought the most interesting finding in the paper is that the high collateral demand actually negatively affects repo market functioning. And the idea is that if a lender doesn't like the collateral that the borrower has, the lender might not actually lend. And so that can actually make repo trading decline. And so that I thought that was the most interesting result of the paper. So when I was reading the paper, I asked Patrick, you know, what kind of feedback he wanted on the paper. And he asked me, uh, maybe he could, I could think of something punchy for the structural model. So here, here we go. But I think maybe this is actually not going to be good based on your last slide. Um, so I thought maybe you could use the model to assess the UK's latest monetary policy framework. But I don't know, if, maybe you can tell me after this if you can actually do that. So the Bank of England has committed to using its operational standing facility and short-term repo facility as its ceiling tool to assess bank reserve demand as it undergoes QT. Um, and what is interesting about the short-term repo facility is that it, its rate is at the bank rate, which is actually a little bit of an in-the-money rate. And so I thought that as collateral, when collateral demand is very high, meaning that lenders might not actually lend in the repo market, will these facilities now actually step in to meet that funding demand for borrowers in the repo market? So I went over to the Bank of England's website and I was looking at how much is being borrowed from the short-term repo facility. And I plotted uh, the borrowing over the last year and you can see 
over the last few months, borrowing has significantly increased at the facilities. So over the like, last month, it was $40 billion a day. Uh, so could it be that collateral demand, when it's very, very high, it is now at the Bank of England, these, uh, the short-term repo facility now that is meeting the funding demand in repo markets, and a inadvertent uh, benefit of these facilities is that it's assisting with repo market functioning. And perhaps your structural model can show this. Now, my second comment is more actually just a question. And I was curious why D dealers don't rehypothecate in the sterling yield repo market. Because this might just be a difference to the US. And if that is the case, then I thought that could be a very interesting result. So Sebastian Infante and a new paper with Zach Cerave, they find that when collateral demand in the US, specifically in the treasury market, increases, dealers actually reuse that collateral to meet that funding demand. So dealers will actually reuse the same treasury QCIP up to five times per day. So I'm borrowing their figure two from their paper, and I know it's quite complicated, but the point of the, uh, this figure here is to, on the asset side, you have that, uh, the green diamond, and, which is unencumbered, and the blue rectangle, which is also unencumbered. You can also see that on the liability side. So anything basically on a dealer balance sheet that is unencumbered, they will try to reuse again as a liability by, lent, by borrowing it, by borrowing it in the repo market by using it as collateral. So they try to reuse it up again, again, and again, up to five times per day. So I was curious why this did not occur in sterling gilt markets. Because I know Patrick was talking about that the dealer's motivation in the gilt market is to hedge interest rate risk. But in the US, dealers borrow collateral from investors that seek interest rate exposure and then lend it to those investors seeking safe asset properties. And so I was wondering if they could use their rich transaction data to see if dealer repo transactions use the same QCIP as their reverse repo transactions and find that when actually when collateral demand is high, their reuse actually drops. And this could be a novel result because this is the exact opposite of what happens to the US. And this would actually relate to all of the safe asset scarcity papers, I think, that is caught in, in Europe as opposed to the US because obviously safe assets are much more scarce in Europe than they are in the US. So in conclusion, it's a fascinating paper that brings two important concepts together with the structural model. And I'm hopeful you can use your model to assess the new UK monetary policy ceiling, ceiling tools. Thank you very much. Okay, floor is open for questions. All the way in the back. Let's keep the questions short, please, and mention your name. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm uh, Kenji Fujita from the Bank of Japan, and uh, yeah, thank you for your excellent analysis. And my question is about uh, kind of conceptual issue that you point out that uh, collateral demand reduces the, the market functioning of repos. And uh, do you think that it matters um, only in the stress time or extraordinary times, like you know uh, the large scale holdings of the asset by the central bank, or it matters uh, uh, in normal time too? And uh, because uh, I'm asking. This question, I ask this question because it uh, relates to the uh, policy suggestions. Uh, whether um, if uh, it matters only in the extraordinary times, the policy design should be, uh, you know, the, the government or central bank step in only in those times. So, uh, yeah, that's my question. Then, uh, lady next. Yes, thank. You. Hi, Amy Huber from Orton. Um, fascinating paper. I was wondering if you would um, entertain the thought of trying to measure funding demand, not relative to an absolute level, but rather relative to funding costs in other markets. What I'm trying to get across is the fact that the funding demand that you recover effectively follow the policy rate. 
But actually what might be more interesting is that funding cost or funding demand relative to what dealers or other participants could get in other markets. We know that one of the reasons why repo, is, uh, repo collateral demand could be interesting is because when repo is on special, you could borrow it actually at a very cheap rate. So I think relative to the opportunity cost of getting the same funding from other market might hold the keys of understanding some of your results. Then we have Jean David here. Could someone bring a mic up front? Yeah. First row. Thank you. Um, Jean David Sigo, ECB. Uh, just um, one thing. When you uh, shutting down the the collateral demand, it seems that you shutting down two different things depending on you, uh, whether you're looking at the borrower or the lender. The borrower might um, value collateral because I mean, between cash and collateral, there's a high. Uh, they are highly substitute. Whereas on the lender, um, the, the, the collateral demand might, might come from the willingness to short the collateral. Are you able within your, uh, your model to, to tweak and to just um, you know, shut down the collateral demand only for one side but not the other side and you might get different results? Thank you. Okay, okay. Patrick, back to you. Okay, uh, thanks very much. So in reverse order then, um, what we can do empirically is we estimated a single eater at the ITA level, but we can estimate it whether they're going in or out, whether they're lending or borrowing. So that would speak directly to whether I care about temporary ownership in the same way that I give, care about giving up permanent ownership, which are the two sides of it. And the results largely, largely go through. Yeah, so they're the same. Um, uh, Amy's idea about funding costs in, in other markets uh, is a great idea. We haven't thought about that, but we, we will certainly do that. Um, the question about whether it matters or not in, in times of stress is a good one. So I did show that quantification of what the counterfactual does in times of stress and not in times of stress. And um, you know, clearly the difference is much smaller in absolute terms in times in normal times. Um, in relative terms, that factor of three that I mentioned seems relatively consistent, but that appears to be mostly an artifact of, of the model as far as I can tell. So yes, in, in absolute terms, it seems to matter most for, for times of stress. Um, and then thanks to Desiree uh, for a great, a great discussion, certainly some punchy ideas which we're looking to, to build into it. You know, people, People often want us to run a regulatory counterfactual, so we're looking for something a little bit more, more tangible to run in a counterfactual, and something relating to monetary policy would be good. The, the issue that the literature faces with that is that you know, monetary policy is a time series, and so identification becomes difficult. Unless you have a nice story, as some of the other papers in the literature have, about cross-sectional differences between banks having access to particular repo facilities, for example, or deposit facilities. Um, so we could do something like that. The, the, the worry we have is that it wouldn't be very cleanly identified in terms of this is the empirical effect of monetary policy on collateral demand. But we can definitely tell a little bit of a story about that. Um, and then one important thing, so I mean, they certainly do rehypothecate in the market. Um, so the model doesn't have rehypothecation. Um, you can, to a certain extent, say, if I care about the collateral because I'm going to lend it out, then that's going to appear as my collateral demand. But ultimately, someone somewhere has to care about these assets differently within the market. And I think it's clear that it does show that. Um, you could, your, your idea of actually measuring in the data Rehypothecation by looking at the QCIPs and seeing what exactly is traded um, is certainly is certainly a good one. But yeah, I should clarify that people do rehypothecate. Uh, we effectively collapse that down, and you can think of our news and our eaters as representing that. Um, so thanks very much, to everyone. All right. Well, thank you very much.